Awesome. Well, I'm glad you guys are here, and we are continuing, actually getting close to wrapping up our study uh, in the book of Philippians, Focused for Life. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great book. And, uh, you know, one of, our, one of our team leaders, one of our board members, John Riley, often has to say things like this to me. He says, don't boil the ocean. Don't boil the ocean. You know, I, I, there's not a new idea that I, I, I hear that I don't like. Uh, and so he says, listen, keep focused, keep focused. And Philippians is doing that for us. And we're about building great men as God defines greatness, right? And that's what Forge is. And as we move into the new year, we are planning initiatives for the new year. Uh, and, and there's going to be Gen 2 of, uh, of Forge. You come and you'll hear more early in the year. But uh, today we're going to be talking about what great men think as we continue to look at our book of Flip. Have you ever had somebody say to you, after you did something, now I want you to think back. Think about the last time you did something that was kind of outside the box, maybe crazy, and somebody said to you, maybe your wife, something like, what were you thinking? Okay, how many of you have had an experience like that within the last week? Raise your hand. Uh, oh, oh, man, more hands than I thought. Why? Because we're guys, right? And so, you know, what were you thinking? And then I say to myself, after somebody says that, if I, was, if, I was, if I had thought about it rightly, I wouldn't have thought that, right? Because our thinking determines our behavior. And so what we're going to be talking about is what great men think. Because all of life comes from our thinking. And the Apostle Paul uh, really emphasizes that today. Uh, when you become a Christian, does Christianity change your life? Answer, yes. But what in your life does it change? Well, everything, right? It's supposed to change everything, right? Coming to faith in Christ, and so many people get this wrong. They don't understand. So many men don't get this reality that when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, he becomes well, the Lord, the master of your life. And so some guys come to Christ and, and, and Christianity for them is kind of like a resume addition. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer or I'm a doctor or I, you know, I'm a teacher or whatever. And, uh, you know, I like to hike or I like to golf. And, yeah, I'm a Christian. And it's kind, of, you know, it's kind of on their resume. That's not the way it is. When you come to faith in Christ, it's a radical transformation of your whole life. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what Jesus says when he says, whoever wishes to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So manhood, when we understand it rightly, is when Jesus Christ becomes the very center of our life. He's our Savior, yes, but he's also our Lord. He's our Master. He's the one to tell us what to do and how to do it. And that affects our mind. See, sin, here's the deal about sin. It's early, I know. You don't want to talk about sin. But, but, but sin has a greater effect on our lives than we could ever imagine. Theologians call it total depravity. Now, your wife may have said you're a totally depraved human being, you know, or your kids or whatever. But the reality about total depravity is not that you and I are as bad as we could be, right? The fact is we're not. Hitler was close. Uh, but, but, but does sin affect every area of our being as a man? Does it affect the way we think? Does it affect the affections of our heart and what we love? Does it affect the decisions that we make? That's what theologians mean when they call that what sin does to us at birth is that it, we are totally depraved. Sin is affect the three major areas of our life. The way we think. We don't think rightly about God. We don't have the right affections about God. And, and, and then we don't make the right decisions. Do we need Jesus in our lives? Absolutely. And so, and so what we're saying here as we talk about our thinking is that the gospel has to change the very core of our thinking. Jethro Tull. <laughs> Jethro Tull, when I was in high school, was a band. I, they're not around anymore, are they? No, I don't. But they, they are. Dave Cutter. Yeah, there's. Okay. So they had a line in one of their songs. I don't know what, you know. What's the ugliest part of your body? What's the ugliest part of your body? What's the ugliest part? 
Some say your nose. Some say your toes. But I think it's your mind. That's what they say. That was a great line. It was true back then. It's true today. And so the Apostle Paul is talking about the reality of how we think. And so, guys, here's the reality. Great men think differently than mediocre men. Christians think differently than other people. Paul gives it to us. Here it is, Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Two verses today. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I see we have Philippians 4, 1 through 7 up there. That's not it. It's 8 and 9, okay? So forget that. There it is. Uh, uh, we're looking at these. And for, I got three points, right? This is the great pastor's sermon. Three points in a poem. Now, here you go, real quick. Let's take a look at the command to control our thinking. Here it is, verse uh, at, at the end of that, verse 9, let your mind dwell on these things or dwell on these things or think on these things. The ESV and other translations just say, finally, brother, whatever's true, da, 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 we'll talk about that. It says, think on these things. That's not strong enough. It's a command in the original Greek, a present imperative, which means do this, do this now, do this always. Present active imperative. And so that's the command. Uh, think on these things. Don't just have a cursory conversation. I, I like how the New American Standard translates it. Dwell on these things. Here's a question. What do you dwell on? At the, at the core of your being, with the kind of man that you are and the kind of man that you become, what do you dwell on? What animates the affections of your heart and the decisions in, in your life. Dwell on these things. There's urgency here. Proverbs 4 puts it this way. <clears throat> Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the streams of life. Now at Forge, we put the heart into perspective right around here. We, we make it very clear what the heart is. Uh, Valentine's Day is coming up in February. You guys, we all need reminders. I'm reminding myself. I'm reminding you. Uh, uh, the heart, the little, you know, all that stuff. When we think of the heart, we think of, oh, that cute little cherub, right? In the biblical way of thinking, I've been trying to train you guys on this because I'm trying to train myself on this. The Hebrew idea of the heart is not Valentine's Day. The Hebrew, the he. I don't know what was said back there, and I don't want to hear it, but uh, the Hebrew idea of the heart is the very center of your being, right? That includes the way you think, the affections of your heart, and the decisions that you make, the center of your being. So when the Bible talks about the heart, it's talking about the center that animates us every day. We are animated from the inside out, what we think, what we feel. Uh, and, uh, and what we do. And so uh, what Paul is saying is in this command to control our thinking, he's saying basically to us today, great men, disciples of Jesus, control their thinking. Their thinking does not control them. They control their thinking. This is an active thing that we can do because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? You, I don't know what, what you were raised with, what you were told when you were younger. Uh, some of you were told, you're, you're wonderful. You've got all kinds of opportunities. Some of you are told you'll never make it. And you have those, those words going through your mind. Some of you, some of you have, uh, are in a difficult relationship right now. And people are saying things to you that aren't true about you. I, the, the reality is we can control our minds, can't we? Do you all agree with that? There's like two heads shaking. Do you believe it in the core of your being that when the Apostle Paul says, dwell on these things, control your thinking, that you can actually do it by the power of God? Yes, you can. Yes, we can. And the difference in so many men that I've run across in the 
150 years that I've been a pastor is that so many men do not control their minds. Their minds control them. Others control them. The Spirit of God doesn't control their thinking. And so they end up making bad decisions. They end up thinking badly about themselves, living in shame and guilt and all kinds of things. And so the Apostle Paul says, when he says, dwell on these things, he's given us a command. Uh, the motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, who was a Christian, used to talk about what kind of thinking? Do you remember that? Stinking thinking. I love it. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale used to talk about the power of positive thinking, right? And he was a liberal, uh, but, he, but he had something right from Scripture, the power of positive thinking. We ought to write a book, The Power of Negative Thinking. Uh, my, my, my granddaughter Molly was in a play at Geneva School um, last week, and she was Piglet in the Winnie the Pooh play. Uh, Christopher Robb, she was the greatest, best Piglet you've ever seen. I want you to know. Uh, uh, and and there's, there's Piglet, and there's Christopher Robbins, and there's Winnie the Pooh, and there's Tigger, T I W G E R. And, uh, and then Eeyore. What role does Eeyore play? The negative, melancholy guy who's, uh, oh me, oh my. And in this play, what are they trying to do? They're going to build a house for, for Eeyore. And everybody's positive. And, and even at the end, it was so awesome. Eeyore got positive. Because he had positive people around him. And that's, that's something that's important for us to keep in mind too. How are you wired? How's your temperament? We're going to talk about temperament again in 2023. Because some of us are more positive oriented by temperament. And some of us are more negative oriented by temperament. By the way we're wired. And we have to have the Holy Spirit control our temperament. Um, George Orwell uh, famous for the book 1984, said this, there are some ideas that are so preposterous that only intellectuals would believe them. <laughs> I love that. Voltaire said, he who can get you to believe absurdities can get you to commit atrocities. So the reality is, is it's very difficult to control our own thinking because of how we were raised by our temperament and by our culture, right? Right? So this command to control what we think is a very, very important command to us as men. And how we control our thinking determines our destiny. I believe that with all my heart. It, I, I believe that it determines the kind of men we will become. Great men or mediocre men or bad men. I, I like the story of the guy who moved to a town and he was getting gas at a gas station across from a church. And, and he asked the gas attendant, he said, I, I'm new to this town and I, I, gotta, uh, I gotta get a new church. Um, tell me some things about that church. Is, is it a good church? And he said, well, let me ask you this. He said, what about the church you came from? And he goes, oh, there were so many negative people in that church. They were all selfish and they were focused on themselves. And oh, it's it kind of a tough church. And the gas station attendant said, you know, you're gonna find that those are the same kind of people right here too. Because wherever you are, there you are. And so the reality is, is that the gospel, the part of the freedom that we have in Christ uh, is, is, is that we have the ability now to control from the inside out. Because where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is in us. And so we can be controlled from the inside out. Has the guilt level gone up a little bit in here? Uh, it has with me. Uh, these, these are two of my life verses that I say almost every day. What are you thinking? Finally, brother, what is true? Pete, what are you thinking? Now, one last thing before I go on to the next point, and that is this. C.S. Lewis in the book Screwtape Letters, where the senior demon is training the younger demon, he says, uh, you know, you need to keep in mind that, that these, um, these mortals always picture us as putting things into their mind. In reality, our best work is in keeping things out. And so the reality is, is that when it comes to our thinking, we have to know what's going on in our mind, what Satan may want to put into our minds, but also what he's trying to keep out of our minds. And that's why the Apostle Paul goes from the command to control our thinking to, 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 uh, to, to the reality uh, that we, we, we have to 
uh, have the content of great thinking. Let's look at them real quick. Um, the content of great thinking, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is what? First one is true. The, the word in the Greek is aletheia, true. Whatever is true. Romans 1, 8 through, 50, uh, 8 through the rest of the chapter tells us that unbelievers lo lo love every day to suppress the truth. That Satan loves to suppress the truth. And so, guys, we are called uh, to focus on those things that are true. True in what categories? True about God? Yeah? Where do we get our ideas of God shaped every day? The Bible. What do we, com what do we hammer you guys to do every day in the morning when you wake up? I know. Get, we're, we're trying to. Steve, I'm glad you're here. If you come back, we're going to hammer you like we hammer all these guys, like I hammer myself. I need a daily appointment with God, right? Why? Because I have to think true thoughts about God lest I entertain false ideas about God, lest that shape my thinking. And you know, there's a lot of guys that think God is out to get them, that God wants to ruin your life. And that's why he gives you all these commands in scripture. He's just trying to destroy, are you kidding me? He created a perfect world. He wants us to flourish, we're his boys. Jesus came into this world uh, to die for us intentionally. He didn't risk death. He chose death for us. Why? So that we would be able to have a restored relationship with the God of the universe and think true thoughts about God. So finally, brethren, whatever is true, I need to think right thoughts about God. And now in Christ, I need to think right thoughts about myself. Right? And you need to think right thoughts about, about you. Who are you? You're the deeply beloved, redeemed son of the most high God. I never say that around here. You need to hear that all the time. I was talking to a friend last week who, uh, who, who, who was, who's been successfully dry for 19 years. And another friend who said, I said, how long have you been dry? And he said, uh, 30 days. Okay, we fail. Uh, but, we're, but our failures don't define us anymore. Jesus defines us. So finally, brother, whatever is true, what we think about God, what we think about ourselves, and what we think about the real world. Somebody says, don't be political. Are you kidding me? The world in which we live is made up of decisions. And we have to think gospel thoughts about how we should vote and how we should live, right? I'm not telling you who to vote for. The vote's passed. I'm not telling. But is it important for you to understand what is true? Of course, in every way about your wife, about your kids. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, think on these things. Uh, Francis Schaeffer used to talk about true truth, true truth. I, I was meeting with an assistant pastor of a church the other day, and he's a young guy, and we were talking about Bible reading, and, and I said, so how often do you read the Bible? He goes, I read the Bible twi through twice in one year. I said, two times in one year? Are you kidding me? Are you trying to earn your way to heaven? I mean, I was guilting him two times in one year. And then the more we talked, the more I realized, this guy has a deep knowledge of God. And he's a, he a young guy, but he's mature and measured. And then I started saying, well, okay, maybe I ought to start reading the Bible two times a year. <laughs> I can't get that into my schedule. How do you get that into your, I don't know. Finally, brethren, whatever is... True. Whatever is honorable. The word is semnos. It's, it's a big concept. Nobly serious. I like to laugh. I like jokes. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in London, years ago told a joke in a, in a sermon. A lady came up and she'd just been sucking on a lemon or something. And she criticized her pastor for telling a joke in church. And he said, Madam, you have no idea what I hold back. Um, guys, you have no idea what I hold back. Seriously. I've, I've been told so many jokes over the years by so many of you guys that I have, I have to, you have no idea what I hold back. Um, I like a good joke. I like humor. But I'm really a pretty serious guy, deep down. I really am. And I love this idea 
of honorable, nobly serious, the dignity of holiness. There is so much that is flippant, cynical, and, and sarcastic in our culture. There are very few really honorable men. And, and honorable men come from honorable thinking. And honorable thinking comes from true thinking from the holy word of God. Um, when, they set, when they set your legacy at your funeral, will they say, he was an honorable man? I hope so. I, I hope my son's here today. Joel, don't forget that. <laughs> you got, I better start working harder on this. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, uh, whatever is just is the word. We talk about justice in our culture today so much. Uh, the idea of justice, whatever is truly just. The problem is, is people are redefining what is justice and what's not today. So how do you determine what's just if we don't know the word of God? That's how we determine what is just. And so finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is, whatever is right, just, just. Uh, and then the next one is whatever is pure. Now this is so convicting. Whatever is pure. That means unsullied by that which is what? Impure. And how do we know what is impure? Again, from the word of God, right? And so, uh, so the reality is finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, does your mind, where does where does your mind go when you're with a bunch of guys and everybody's telling jokes? Does your mind go to the sexual joke? Does your mind go to the, to the sexual innuendo? Where does your mind go? Where does my mind go when I'm with other guys and what I'm doing? Finally, brethren, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that what the gospel wants to do is purify us from the inside out. So that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Those, those are pure thoughts. And we have to regulate them, don't we? Consciously. And we can. We can. Uh, purity. Purity of thought. I, had a, I have a friend, every once in a while he'll just tell me about, uh, hey, you know, sex with my wife is going great. I don't want to hear that. I don't know why he brings that up. He's not here, by the way, so I just want you to know that. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't want to hear that. I, 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 you know? <laughs> so many ways we could go with that one, right? The last, the next one, the fifth one is lovely. Finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, that is not a guy, a guy word. So as you walk out of here today, if you talk to a friend, they say, hey, how was Forge this morning? It's always a lovely time. <laughs> if you say that, please call me. I, we, need to, we need to work on your vocabulary and uh, lovely. It's not, a, it's, but the idea is uh, really the idea of winsome. Uh, what is warm and good and kind, lovely, elevating. You notice how the speech here, uh, the thinking has to be elevated so that our speech is elevated. Uh, there are so many people that are mean and critical and they feel insecure and they finally, brother, whatever is lovely, winsome, good, of good repute is the next one. If something is of good repute, if you can really say it and not have a bad conscience, right? So if, it, if it's worth passing on, it's of good repute. It's worth talking about. There's so much that's not worth talking about uh, that we should just let go. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, or is honorable, or is right, or is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. And this sort of sums it up. If there's any excellence... Arete in the Greek, the Greek mind thought a lot about excellence. If there's any, any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. I'm driving along and I have a thought that comes into my mind. And I'm thinking, where did that thought come from? And there's a couple of sources, right? Three sources, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. So you're driving along, you have this incredibly, this thought, and you go, where did 
did it come from? A little analysis. That came from my sin nature, my flesh. It came from Satan, or it came from the culture. I just saw a billboard or something. Can I control it? Yeah, one of the first things is that is impure. That is not excellent. We can't keep our mind from thinking thoughts, but we can keep from what, guys? Dwelling on them. Yeah, and going there. And so the Christian man who wants to become a great man as God defines greatness, the one who sets the tone in his family, the one who sets the tone in his church. And by the way, it's not your wife that sets the tone in the home, right? It's the man, because we're the leaders of the family. And you know, you've heard, all heard the expression, if mammy ain't happy, nobody's happy. Who's responsible for trying to make mammy happy? I'm, I'm the spiritual leader of the home, and I can't always make mammy happy, but I can help try to set the tone of the home by talking to her later or whatever. And I, but I've got to manage myself first. How about your business? You got to manage your mind before you can manage your people. How about your clients? How about your, the people you're trying to sell to? It all is applicable. So the command to control our thinking, uh, the content of great thinking, there it is, and the command to actionable thinking is the last thing. Look at verse 9. The things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. There is Paul going again. He's saying, you want an example of a man who thinks in a godly way, look at what I do, look at how I think, look at the practices that are in my life. He says, look at me. That's tough, but I was thinking about this on the way over here, that I, I am called to be a role model for crying out loud. I am. For better, for worse, you are too, all of us, right? And, and, and we're the examples of the gospel. And there's a lot of great examples here. But, but Paul says, let your, let your thinking, this is actionable stuff, right? So here's my challenge. One challenge, and then you either can go to breakfast with your team or stay here and talk for a few minutes. We'll have the questions up there. This is just one challenge. Memorize these two verses. And get the, I don't care what translation of the Bible you memorize in. Uh, the New American Standard is what I, trans, I, I memorize out of. It was English as we've never spoken it. So it's an older translation. I, I recognize that. Do the ESV. Do the NIV. Do the New Living. I don't care. Memorize these two verses. Out of the book of Philippians, th these will change your life. Because the word of God renews us, right? It renews the mind. Finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind, what? Dwell. Dwell on these things. And when your mind is going in the other direction, what do you do? Kick yourself. I don't know how you're going to do it. But I know that the Holy Spirit has the ability to kick my thinking into gear because he has those verses up here and in here. If he can do it with me and control my thinking, are you kidding? He can control your thinking. Day in, day out, if your thinking changes, everything changes. Right? Do you believe it? Do you believe that the gospel of a dead man getting up and walking is true? That the tomb in Israel is empty and so is the cross. And that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Where will this change your life this week? If you have any stories in about a week of changes that God makes in your life because of these two verses, let me know. I'm praying for you. Will you pray for my mind? Will you pray for me on this? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we're your sons. And, and Lord, a lot of our guilt is internal. 
even with what we've been thinking. <laughs> and so we come to you today and confess that our thinking is not always where it should be about you, about our life. Sometimes we suck up our culture so much that we don't even know we're thinking in destructive ways. So Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would move on our forge men, all of us, starting with me, in this movement of men in the greater Orlando area, Lord, for the Longwood guys, for the guys downtown that I'm going to be with today, for the virtual teams that we have, would, would you systemically move in the hundreds of lives of forge men so that these, these truths of our thinking could be controlled by your holiness and that it could change our marriages, our kids, our grandkids, our workers, and give us a much more positive approach to what you're doing in this broken world. We ask you to move in ways that are absolutely stunning for your honor, for your glory. And Lord Jesus, in this time of the year, this second week in Advent, we're reminded that you came to Bethlehem, headed to the cross, that we could be set free from stinking thinking, from evil thinking, to be men of pure minds and pure hearts. So we commit ourselves to that, grateful that you love us more than we can even comprehend as we pray these things in the strong name of our risen Savior Jesus. God's men said. Amen. Guys, talk about it some here or at breakfast, and we'll see you next week. I won't have any gingerbread for you, but uh, we'll see you in the gingerbread room next week. Take care. Tomorrow. God bless you. Tomorrow. What's that? Tomorrow is December 7th, a memory of Pearl Harbor. Uh, 81 years. Don't forget it, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you for our vets.